Hello, and welcome to our presentation on the Georgia Open History Library from Colony to Statehood, also known by its acronym GOAL. I'm Lana Brand, Digital Publishing and Metadata Coordinator for the University of Georgia Press. My co-presenters, Kat Stein, Director of the Hargrit Rare Book and Manuscript Library, Nate Holly, an Acquisitions Editor for the Press, and I are excited to talk to you about this innovative use of primary resources. This is a three-part presentation. First, I'll begin by giving an overview of the Goal Project and its hosting platform, Manifold. Kat will follow with a description of the partnerships that produce Goal and the primary resources that were included. And finally, Nate will wrap up with some use case scenarios. Goal is a project of the UGA Press. The press has been engaged in publishing peer-reviewed historical scholarship since its founding in 1938. With over 1,800 books in print, we're the oldest and largest publisher in the state and have a strong record in publishing significant works on Georgia history. Goal is supported by the NEH's Humanities Open Book Program, which funds university presses and scholarly associations in creating open digital editions of outstanding humanities books. By taking advantage of digital technology, the program allows teachers, students, scholars, and the public to read humanities books that can be downloaded or redistributed for no charge. 45 print titles were chosen from the press's backlist for the project. Our grant proposal included commissioning new forewords from leading experts that provided historical context for new readers and engaging our file vendor to create accessible EPUB files for all learners. The press convened an advisory board of experts representing the Atlanta History Center, the Georgia Historical Society, the UGA History Department, Georgia Humanities, the New Georgia Encyclopedia, and the Hargrit Rare Book and Manuscript Library, along with our UGA Press editors, to select the 45 titles for the program. The title list includes important primary source documents, such as Colonial Records of Georgia by James Oglethorpe and the detailed reports of the Salzburgers, as well as later scholarly monographs that illuminate the relationship of Georgia to other groups, colonies, countries, and the new union. On October 15th, 2021, these titles were published as open access digital eBooks and print paperback editions. In March, 2022, the press began circulating a goal exhibit statewide, which includes a tablet exhibition of the digital editions, as well as samples of the print copies. And we anticipate interest in this period of early national history growing as the country approaches the 250th anniversary of its founding in 2026. The open digital editions are available on a variety of websites for reading, downloading, and printing. These sites include the Press's Manifold platform, Affordable Learning Georgia, which is the USG's open educational resource repository, the Digital Library of Georgia, and the Digital Public Library of America Exchange and Open Bookshelf. The titles are also discoverable via a wide range of aggregators, including Project Muse, Books at JSTOR, and Hottie Trust, as well as WorldCat. The press relied on our UGA library colleagues for many of these services and learned so much from them along the way. Additionally, the print paperback editions are available at an affordable price from the press and all major booksellers. Please see the resources included with our presentation for URLs to each goal access point. This project gave the press an opportunity to explore our new Manifold instance. Manifold is an open source platform for publishing networked, iterative, media rich, and interactive monographs on the web, and is also a place to reveal the scholarship process by gathering and sharing research materials, rich media, interviews, raw data, notes, or anything else with a digital footprint. A partnership between the University of Minnesota Press the GC Digital Scholarship Lab at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and Cast Iron Coding. Manifold was released in March 2018 and funded by the Mellon Foundation. UGA Press was chosen as a pilot site soon thereafter. Readers who have created an account on our Manifold instance will have added functionality, including the ability to create and join reading groups. Reading groups are a way for readers to annotate and comment on texts as a cohort and is geared toward classroom and peer review use cases. 
With reading groups, readers can create public, private, and anonymous annotation groups, invite others to join their groups, and manage group membership. When engaging with a text, readers can associate their annotations with those groups of which they are a member. This feature combined with the following and notification functionalities make Manifold an ideal tool for teaching, learning, and collaborative research. When logged in, a link will display in the Manifold menu to the following view. Every Manifold project thumbnail includes a plus sign badge that can be toggled on and off. When toggled on, the badge will become a check mark, indicating that the project is now being followed. Followed projects are collected in the following view as a, a shortcut for readers to quickly navigate to those projects in which they are most interested. Using the notification settings, Manifold readers can have the system send either a daily or weekly email that summarizes any new texts, resources, or resource collections that have been added to projects they are following. Additionally, readers can opt to have Manifold send an email in real time when a reply has been made to one of their annotations or comments. The magnifying glass icon in the Manifold menu opens a search bar that allows readers to look for specific content across an entire instance, and results can be filtered by content type. Depending on their context, other magnifying glass icons found throughout the instance allow readers to search within project collections, as seen here, within individual pro projects or within texts. As I mentioned, Manifold allows authors and readers to search, annotate, and share texts and comment on resources, as well as adjust font, type size, and contrast for readability. Texts are easily navigated using the contents dropdown. This combination of accessibility and functionality is especially novel for archival and original manuscripts, which Kat will elaborate on next. Projects in Manifold are designed to encourage discourse, engage readers, and foster conversation. And Nate will later demonstrate these features in a few use case scenarios in which readers might utilize these features within the goal project collection. In admin mode, adding new projects and modifying existing ones is intuitive and allows extensive customization and enhancement. Site managers can adjust color schemes, add lo logos, create custom pages, and standalone projects without a developer. The Manifold backend also includes a built-in analytics reporting system that functions independent of Google or other third-party providers. This view displays global engagement, aggregating user activity from across the instance into eight reports, which can be configured by date. This view displays project-specific engagement, aggregating user activity into five reports, which can also be configured by date. Not only is Manifold user-friendly and functional for readers, but also for content contributors and managers. Now I'll hand it over to Kat to highlight key goal partners and primary resources. I'm Kat Stein, director of the Harvard Rare Book and Manuscript Library, one of three special collections libraries at the University of Georgia. The Harvard Library documents the evolving history and culture of the state of Georgia and its peoples. Home to the largest collection of Georgiana, publications by and about Georgians, the Harvard also serves as the archive for the UGA Press. When the press convened the Georgia Open History Library Advisory Board, Harvard was a natural partner. Not only do we house the archival copies of the press's published works, which were used to create the new eBooks, we're also home to a number of original manuscripts documented in the project. The Journal of Peter Gordon, one of the first settlers to arrive in the Georgia colony alongside Oglethorpe. Lachlan McIntosh papers documenting this early Georgian's life through the Revolutionary War. And the Law of the Creeks, an 1825 copy of the laws written by Chile McIntosh son of the Creek Chief General William McIntosh, all form part of Harvard's Keith Reed collection. Reed was a collector of Georgia documents and upon his death in 1940, his collection was purchased by the Wormsloaf Foundation of Savannah, which presented to the collection to UGA in 1957. Additionally, Harvard houses the Earl of Egmont papers containing manuscript copies of documents from the establishment of the Georgia colony 
These documents provide a comprehensive information regarding the settlement of Georgia, especially in Savannah and Frederica, relations with native peoples, and activities of the French and Spanish. Many of the documents are transcribed in the volumes of the colonial records of the state of Georgia. In addition to Hargret, this project also collaborated with the Digital Library of Georgia, the state's cultural heritage digitization initiative housed at the UGA libraries. DLG is also a service hub providing metadata records and digital object links for the Digital Public Library of America. Several original manuscripts that form the basis for these publications were already available through DLG. For example, the Journal of Peter Gordon and the Laws of the Creeks are freely available through DLG along with metadata records and transcripts. Other digitized collections like the Laga Macintosh papers lacked transcripts. This project provides searchable text for these incredibly fragile and difficult to read documents and greatly enhances accessibility. Additionally, this project encouraged us to digitize the transcripts from the Egmont papers and link them to the Colonial Records of Georgia publications. The newly written forwards in the open library editions provide up-to-date context outlining the challenges that early Georgians faced and highlighting the roles of race, class, and gender in the development of the state. The Georgia Open History Library is now a collection in the DLG and the eBooks are available as both searchable full text and links in the manifold records. These records are also discoverable through the Digital Public Library of America. The library's cataloging department provided metadata work for the updated items in OCLC and created records with links to the online versions. Additionally, Hargret added related material notes to finding aids that linked to the manifold records and encouraged researchers to use these new additions in their research. A physical exhibit highlighting the open library project, including original manuscripts and digital versions of the titles, through Manifold and the DLG was on display in the Hargret Galleries last year. This exhibit included two volumes of the letters from Georgia from the Egmont papers, the journal of Peter Gordon and a selection of Macintosh's papers plus several editions of Oglethorpe's writing. The digital versions of the manuscripts and eBooks were browsable on two tablets in the gallery. Additionally, a UGA undergraduate developed a virtual version of the exhibit available on the UGA library's website. The press also developed a small traveling exhibit that highlights the project on a series of vinyl banners. This traveling banner exhibit and digital content is available for loan to cultural institutions across the state. Please contact the UGA press if your institution is interested in borrowing this exhibit. A major component of this project is to encourage engagement by educators, students, and the general public with these materials. For example, undergraduate student docents developed virtual and in-person tour stop scripts, highlighting items included in the project. And Harvard staff incorporated the colonial records of Georgia into virtual eighth grade classroom activities focused on the experiences of the earliest colonists. The Manifold app provides new ways of engaging with these resources and the diversity of subjects allows for them to be incorporated into a diverse range of classes and educational activities. These highly accessible eBooks provide greater access to historic documents about the establishment of the Georgia colony and enhance access to archival objects. Thank you, Kat. Now Nate will demonstrate a few goal use case scenarios for students, teachers, scholars, and citizens. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nate Holly, and I'm an acquisitions editor here at the University of Georgia Press. Uh, and I'm excited to talk to you a bit about the Georgia Open History Library and what you might do with it, um, at least from my particular perspective. Um, so I think it would help a bit if I introduced uh, myself and explained my background a little bit um, before launching into a little bit of uh, the background on the Georgia Open History Library and its um, composition, the, the titles that are in there. And then I'll talk a little bit about how uh, researchers, students, teachers, scholars might use the Georgia Open History Library in, in various capacities. So first, about me. Um, 
uh, in addition to, to serving as an acquisition, acquisitions editor here at the University of Georgia, of Georgia Press, which means that I um, am one of three people here who acquire the, the books that we publish. I talk to the authors who might be in the process of writing a book, and then of course, um, usher them through the peer review process um, and get them to the, to the point where I can send them over to another department to go get their stuff copyrighted. But, so that's, that's what I do here at the press, at least partially. The other um, part of things here is that I, before I started at the University of Georgia Press, um, I received a PhD in early American history from William and Mary. So of course, I, I'm intimately familiar with a, with a number of the, the volumes in the Georgia Open History Library for, for research purposes. Um, but I also have the privilege to teach uh, a variety of undergraduate classes at William and Mary. Um, from surveys to upper level undergraduate classes where um, research papers were the, were the norm, right? And, uh, and at that point, I would have really wished that the Georgia Open History Library was a thing. Um, instead of having to send students to the library to try to find primary documents on the shelves. So uh, I have some ideas about how the Georgia Open History might be useful for those sorts of folks. So that's me. Um, now let's talk, let me talk a bit about the Georgia Open History Library. And I am going to, pardon my clicking here, um, I am going to share my screen so you can, you can watch me uh, click through things and sort of see how that works. Uh, I guess I should also apologize for the Clemson scarf behind me, go Tigers. Um, but so here is here's Georgia Open History Library on our manifold instance, and, and as um, you know, as as Kat mentioned, it's it's available in a number of different places, and showed you right, it's available in a number of different places. This is one of those places. Um, there are, as you can see, there are forty four volumes here. When this process started, and it started with uh, an application to the National Endowment for the Humanities for a um, book grant, I believe is what it's called. Um, part of the application process meant selecting which of the out of print volumes that we had published were gonna be included in this effort to digitize and make freely available online. And that involved uh, not only internal press discussions, but also um, in consult consultation with an advisory board made up of uh, folks from throughout the state. Um, so as, as part of those meetings, we settled on 50 titles that are going to be included. And for various reasons, that, that number got whittled down to 44. Um, and, you know, as you'll see to today uh, during the talk, but also as you, you yourself click through these um, these books, right, these digitized books, is that there are both, and you can see it right here, the first two, there are both monographs, right, scholarly monographs, secondary sources that have been out of print for a while, many of these published um, in the middle of the 20th century, so pretty early on in our history, we were founded in 1938. Um, so books like that, secondary sources, uh, and also ones like the colonial records of the state of Georgia, right, so primary source volumes. Um, so those, that's sort of what's in the uh, Georgia Open History Library, but as, as you see when you click into these sources, and this is one, and I'm going to talk, there's a reason I have this particular one pulled up, each of these new volumes also has a new forward by a scholar. Um, and, and as you might imagine, those scholars do different things as they're writing their forwards. Uh, they use their forwards for different purposes. Um, for example, uh, Sarah Deer, who is a Muscogee Creek, uh, and an attorney who teaches at the University of Kansas School of Law, wrote the forward for uh, Laws of the Creek Nation. And for Sarah, um, 
when we asked her to write this, and of course, in publishing things, things take a little while. So when we asked her to write this, and this is the, the forward, this is her forward to the reissue, you can see that the, the first thing that she brings up is something that was happening at the time, right? She submitted this forward soon after the, the US Supreme Court ruled in McGirt versus Oklahoma, right? So what Sarah is doing here, and she, she lays it out, and I should note here before I, before I, you know, dive into this a little bit that I am logged into my profile here, which means that I highlighted this uh, a week a week or so ago, right? And it's still here. It's here for me to, to call back up immediately. Um, I know it was important to me then. It's important to me now. I could have also, if I wanted to, um, imitated it, right? Um, and so that is now living here. Um, so, so what Sarah Deer does here and what she hopes to do with her forward, um, is to highlight how considering these laws from the early 19th century continue to have relevance for contemporary Muskogee people, especially for the fields of American Indian studies and Indian law, but also for the people themselves, right? This, this has real world material consequences, which I, which I think is important. Um, and so she does that, does that very thoroughly. And this is, this is a quick way to show students how a document written in 1818 still matters in very concrete ways, right? Um, so that's why I wanted to highlight this one, right? Because the connections between the past and the present are right on the surface. So that's that's one sort of forward. Um, the other forward, a couple forwards I'm gonna highlight, and for the first things I'm gonna do are um, some primary source forwards, but I wanted to do it in concert with the, these DLG educator resources that, that, are, that are online. Uh, the, especially the ones for, and these are for the, the colonial period of the eighth grade curriculum, right? Which is of course, um, when Georgia students learn about Georgia history. So I wanted to highlight a, a couple things here. First, importantly, a link to the Georgia Open, His Open History Library is available here. So it's easily accessible from this page. Um, but for example, question three, right, evaluate, evaluate the role of diverse groups in settling Georgia during the trustee period. Um, the colonial records of Georgia are one of the multi-volume primary source collections in the Georgia Open History Library. The other is, are the detailed reports on the Salzburg immigrants who settled in America, right? There are 17 volumes of that in here. And so this question calls out Salzburgers directly, right? Um, and here in the forward to one of those volumes, um, and I should note that the, the forward, even though there are 17 volumes, the forward for this, in this particular case, is the same for all 17 volumes. Um, colonial records of Georgia, they're tailored a bit to, to each volume. But what the, the forward author here, who's Ben Marsh, who has recently written a book about silk in colonial Georgia, um, what he does here is both set out what the Salzburgers wanted to do with this publication, right? Which is show how they um, subdued the Georgia wilderness and, and, and built a, a successful and flourishing religious community. But, right, as I've, again, as I've highlighted here, what Marsh notes is that even though this was intended as a curated archive showing a singular power at work in the, in the wilderness of Georgia, what the detailed reports actually reveal uh, are the multiplicity of people's interests, languages, and ambitions at play in the 18th century low country, right? Um, these quote unquote settlers were not just Salzburgers, they were from everywhere and they lived in the same place and they fought with each other and they built things together, right? So these sorts of sources as forward authors point out Right, it's here for 
eighth graders wanting to answer this question, they could find at least a, a, an arrow pointing to look here, right here. And then they can, they can dig into um, the, the primary source itself and see, and see what, what they can find in this question. So that's question three. Question four, right? Explaining the transition of Georgia into a royal colony, especially as it pertains to land ownership, slavery, alcohol, and government. The thing you go to there are the colonial records of Georgia. Again, this is a um, one selected, a, a volume selected at random. But the, the forward here, written by Julianne Sweet, who's a scholar of colonial Georgia. Again, for this volume, note that scholars, students, can also begin to discern the fractures that started to form between protest trustee and anti-trustee factions about topics such as, stop me if this sounds familiar, land distribution and usage, labor practices, slavery, abuse of authority, um, that would prevent colonists from working together for their own common good, right? So at this point, you know, theoretically a student could say, oh, this might be, this might be a solution in their trying to figure out what that meant for alcohol, no results for alcohol in there, right? But um, I imagine their results, let's see, let's see if we can find something about land. Look here. Yeah, so there's there's all sorts of stuff in here for students to answer that question. Okay, so so that's that, and those are two forwards to um, primary sources and the search function of the primary sources. And I'll show you one more um, search function thing before I wrap it up for the day. Um, the search functions um, are great for both students and for scholars. Um, but the, those were those two volumes I just highlighted were primary sources. I wanted to highlight a bit um, forwards to secondary sources. Uh, these these are particularly important, I think, maybe not for the eighth grade classroom, but for upper level undergraduate classes and graduate classes, especially those classes where historiography is an important part of what is happening uh, in, in the classroom, um, where students should grapple with books, maybe not published in the last 10, 20 years, right? But books published, let's just say in the middle of the 20th century, right? And both the problems with those books, inherent in those books, I'm gonna highlight a couple here, but also, even with those problems, the value that those books still have, right? Good historiography doesn't mean throwing a book out in the 1950s that was published in the 1950s, uh, throwing it all out, right? There's, there's almost certainly stuff in there um, that remains important. So, for example, this, this title, which is Old Petersburg and the Broad River Valley of Georgia, uh, written by Ellis Merton Coulter and published in... 1965, as the forward, this forward author notes, uh, keep they bear from uh, Auburn University. Coulter, like many white Southern born historians of the era, never escaped the lost causes domineering influence on the region's history, culture, and politics, right? So his interpretations are colored by that political position, according to, according to the forward author, right? That Coulter saw history as a powerful tool that explained and justified Southern exceptionalism, right? Which means that he saw it as his job to explain racial segregation and its importance, right? And promoting those quote unquote Southern virtues. So this is a, and you know, as a, as a result of those emphases, he neglected some roots of Cherokees. Greeks, etc. Um, I think uh, that there's a way in the classroom, and I've done this different ways, but there's a way to use the, these sort of forwards and the identifying the potential shortfalls of these secondary sources with these uh, monographs and having students find out, figure out what, what Coulter in this case said about Cherokee and Creek Indians 
and then going to those primary sources and actually answering the question, right? So that's, that's this title. Another title is sort of in a similar vein uh, as the American Revolution in Georgia. This book was published in 1958. Imagine how the interpretations of the American Revolution in Georgia have changed in the intervening decades, or how they haven't. Um, that would be interesting to take a look at, of course. But what this forward author, is Andrew O'Shaughnessy, um, says is that, of course, N.F. Coleman's study inevitably reflects the priorities and views of its time. So he says nothing about women, uh, George, women in Georgia during the Revolutionary period, nothing of really about African Americans. But, and this is the key sentence, right? Yet it is still important for students of history to read the work of an earlier generation of historians like Coleman, because while such books may reveal the limitation of earlier interpretations of the past, they also can be a corrective to our own preoccupations and real, reveal the deficiencies of current historical writing. Right, so there's a historiographical task here for students, but again, at the top there, there is also uh, a historical task for students um, to tell the story about Georgia women or African Americans um, in Georgia during the Revolutionary period. Um, so that's, to me, I just wanted to highlight, use these forwards to both highlight the sorts of books that are in there and what you might use the forwards for, what the forwards reveal as potential uh, classroom exercises. Um, just quickly here in the remaining few minutes I have, I wanted to highlight a, a, another couple potential things that the Georgia Open History Library would be useful for. So in this case, um, using using DLG, I've, I've sort of pulled up the Lachlan Macintosh papers uh, in the University of Georgia Libraries. Again, here's a link directly to the, the Georgia Open History Library volume, which is which is also on the that main um, manifold page. Um, so that's here and linked, but the thing that I think would be quite useful, and I've of course done this uh, in upper level undergraduate classes where primary source research was necessary, especially if that was a class about the 19th century or earlier, um, when manuscripts for people, when it's really only manuscripts outside of you know, some newspapers that survive, it's how you find out about the past, right? So learning how to read transcribe cursive in the Macintosh papers and then sort of comparing it to what's in the Georgia Open History Library volume, maybe even finding a mistake or two, um, I think is a, an important skill for potential for historians and training to have, right? So that's a good thing to do in the classroom as you're sort of learning Georgia history here. Um, the other thing I'll just say quickly, and I'm, I'm going to use my own research um, to highlight this because that's that's sort of what I know best. And so my, my dissertation research was about Cherokees, colonial urban places, um, or early American urban places, I should say, which included, of course, Savannah and Charleston and New Orleans, but also places farther afield like London and Philadelphia, New York City, um, Montreal. But if I had had access to the Georgia Open History Library, and I was searching for those needles in a haystack, what I would have done instead of relying on a, an index or reading the whole volume in search of mention of Cherokees in colonial cities, what I would have done is typed in, at least as a start, right? Type in Cherokee in the search bar. All these things pop up. Of course, there's an index, right? Um, mention the Cherokee River, Disappearances. Um, you, you sort of scroll through it a bit. Ah. So there is a, here we go, evidence of a consequence of a treaty being concluded between the Cherokees and the governor of New Orleans last November, right? So Cherokees are in New Orleans. I would click on that and, and chase that trail. Um, other 
any other, I'm going through this quickly. Uh huh. New Orleans has sent a strong invitation to both Cherokees and Creeks to come and see him. Again, Cherokee's going to New Orleans. And His Ex Excellency dispatched a proper talk to the Cherokees, inviting them to a conference at Charleston. Again, so this isn't, the, the search function isn't perfect, right? Obviously, but it is a wonderful start, right? Where you can click on it. You can highlight it, right? So it stays highlighted. And write an annotation if you want to, right? And so this is a this is research that is preserved for you. Um, and of course, you can also use the, the sort of reading groups that, that Lana outlined as a way for you to for classes to have conversations about particular research questions um, using using primary sources. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there, but you know, I could go on. There are dozens of ways to use the Georgia Open History Library in the classroom. And it's a useful tool for all sorts of research, right? You know, direct people who have questions to investigate the Georgia Open History Library, do some searches, do read the forwards to see what's in there, right? And what's not in there. Um, and, you know, the, the hope is that this is a project, the Georgia Open History Library, that will continue to expand and will continue to add um, volumes to the volumes to the library for the, the people of Georgia to use. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you to my co-presenters and to you for viewing our presentation. Please explore the Georgia Open History Library and the resources provided with this presentation. Have a great day.